So if anyone has a question they want to start off, we could be on any of the talks that we saw this morning or something completely different but related to the topic of programming. So. Okay, yeah, Andre, ask me. So, the question I think I'd like to hear an answer to is the where we're developing software with teams, programmers, and uh, stock assessment models, so the sort of mathematicians, statisticians, and programmers. What is the organizational structure that makes that work? Because obviously there's very different disciplines being involved. And I guess I'm looking to the NOAA people who talked about what they were doing, but I guess the challenge to my mind is how do they do it and how do we ensure that we're communicating what we, we're doing? Because to be honest, stock assessment is sort of well known for tricks, I think is the uh, technical term I've already got to the NLE. Um, and uh, we usually don't admit those, but they're actually quite important in our, in our software. So I was intrigued to know what the experience was before we start worrying about how we make our code wonderful. Let's see what the benefits of these folks are. Or at least I'll extend the question. So, um, and I guess a corollary is I'm amazed at how little time we spend as a community getting together and actually comparing code, actually sitting down and how are you doing this in terms of how are you doing it, and coming to a common understanding of approaches. Um, you know, we didn't do that with any of the previous capital workshops. We right? had the selectivity workshop, but we didn't have a captain devoted to how are we coding selectivity methods. I think that kind of thing would help us as come together as a community on how we approach things. I, I agree completely. I think that first question is a horrible question. I, I think it should be, how can the next generation model be coded by stock assessment scientists and professionally trained computer program? What is the nature of the team and what are the necessary minimum diversity of team member uh, disciplines there? You certainly need programmers, you need statisticians, you need you know, biologists, you need people who understand how populations work. They're part of the team too. Yeah. And I, I think leaving out of the project the people who understand the animals. One thing I yeah. I mean, one thing I, I've come to realize over the years is that part of the Part of the challenge our community collectively faces is that some people approach it as modelers and some people approach it more as statisticians. Statisticians tend to be more reductionist. You don't put a feature into a model unless it makes things better. Whereas the modelers tend to put features in because you know that process is happening in the real world. And I think that same difference goes into the difference between ecosystem modelers and fish assessment models. Fish assessment modelers are more operations research analyst oriented. Ecosystem modelers are more the processes in the real world. So I think we need to recognize these kinds of characteristics of our disciplines in order to build on the right team. So just before we go into this in too much more detail, um, we have our session on next, which is on model features, which kind of covers some of that one, you know, who should be involved in developing model features. And at the end of Friday, we also have a session on structure and, and things of the project. So we might be getting off topic. Yeah. Patrick. Okay. Uh, 
So, yeah, the question seems still in the uh, scope. Um, so, I was just going to say how it works with this particular team is uh, communication as you would expect, right? There's a lot of communication regular among them with their you know, supervisory chain as a normal account works, but under the direction of expert teams like the uh, stock assessment, the national stock assessment group. Um, anyway, the thing is that's unique though is that this is their full time job. And they were hired to do that job. So they knew what they were getting into. Um, and it was to operate the right now, sort of software development stuff. But in most cases, resources aren't available to have that structure set up. So that's that's the issue. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Um, I, I think that um, we, we should not analyze too much about how things are organized because uh, the teams are made of people and people organize themselves in different ways. So, uh, the, uh, a specific way of organizing. A number of people may not be the best way to organize a team. So I think at that point, uh, I wouldn't talk much too much about it. But I think it's important, as a, as a, in my opinion, is that the teams need to be multidisciplinary. And that is something that we, we, for historical reasons in the past, it didn't happen. Most of these solutions were developed by someone with a certain need, and then things evolved. And, uh, um, these days, seeing the, the complexity of the models we are looking for, the complexity of the data we are dealing with, the, the technologies that are being involved in these things, uh, it seems obvious that we need a group of people that are different with different skills. Some of them are computer oriented, some of them are process oriented. I would, I would like to have an economist, for example, involved in some of these things. Um, so, that, I guess that's, that would be my approach to the problem here. It's not so much of trying to decide who is involved, but trying to decide that that has to be a multidisciplinary, multi-skilled team that actually works together. Whatever better work for that. That's fine. Um, one thing I want to mention just before I go to the next person is that um, a lot of what we're talking about here might be going into the scoping document and the description um, of the features and everything rather than Who's actually doing the programming? How do you uh, organize the programming in terms of best practices and things? So, yeah. 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 Uh, so, I'll talk about, I guess, how, so the how we did it with uh, the spectral population model in Tasha too. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, like half the models that we made, and with this being like, uh, scientist who's really bad at writing code, so that went quite well. And for us, there was a very clear um, discussion of uh, who's accountable for what, and um, where where we segregate our uh, responsibilities. Uh, from the programming side, uh, I was responsible for providing an interface uh, to scientists where he knew exactly where to write his code and what he was getting as far as the time that he was writing the code into. So he could say, I want this value, and I want to quantify. So he didn't have to worry about yeah, what happens underneath the hood. He would just say, I would get this value, and I would do this equation, and I would modify the population like this, and I would hand it back to the system. So every time uh, we talk about the dynamic process, and the observation, and the uh, likelihood of selectivity, there was a very fine pattern of how we did it. There were very, very simple, very clear rules. We had two files to get a source, add one line to this other file, which puts it into the rest of the architecture. React function for us was validate where we had to write your code. And then the, so the, so the, the science staff don't have to worry about what's actually happening under the hood. And equally, I don't have to worry about the science. And then through using uh, sort of test driven development and unit tests, both of us can show the other the integrity of our code. Scientists write the unit test for their methods, their functions, and say, This is my input, this is my output, and this is the problem. The program writes into the framework, and this is the input output, the whole framework itself maintains integrity. And that's worked quite well for us. Um, 
I'll get involved in that team is, and I still have my goals. Um, yeah, so the isolation, isolation. Um, the problem with that is that like essentially you focus up here. You know, if you're a contractor and you go away, I don't know, when you're home, you do it for three years and then you've got this amazing tool. Um, uh, inefficiencies can be Having this beautiful design and being that way into some of life myself. Um, it goes and destroys stuff. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, I, uh, I think I can do it more less isolated. You need to pick the wrong term. Well, you know that, yeah. But resources, so maybe that. So, so presumably, if the, the code was written well, but any program looks good to come in with a specification or feature and add it to the program. But yeah, preferably you want the original program to be good. But if it was done properly, you should be able to use any program. Correct. Yeah, that goes to a point that was brought up earlier today is the fact that scientists sort of are doing research and sometimes it's hard to do the research if you're not programming at the same time because things happen as you're programming on the testing and one thing, right? So there has to be something in the software where there's a, a test version that's split off from the, the main drum that you can play with and then once you sort of finalize what you're doing, you can write the specifications of the to the professional program so that it gets written into the main drum. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, something I'd like to learn more about, which is MDL. Um, I mean, I, I, I think I understand what's going on, but it's as if your model is constructing itself as opposed to synthesis, which has every bell and whistle automatically in the code. So you're carrying a whole bunch of case statements, which I suspect how it's coded, uh, which is how I do things. But as I understand MDL, it's sort of creating the model based on the specifications, which inherently seems like a good thing to do, uh, except I don't know anything about it. I probably have misinterpreted what it's doing. So uh, maybe if others are interested, that's something we might want to learn about. I mean, most of the questions up here, the answer is yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, I, I think console 2 in that respect is unique amongst the packages. All the others are general packages with millions of case statements. Most of us are trained in, whereas what you describe, as I understand it, is a language to create models as opposed to a model that rules them all. Uh, so with, with Castle 2, uh, you know, and with SPM, when we start SPM, um, so Alistair Campbell and said, I don't want this to get a work, but it has to be highly, highly flexible, and we have to support different types of population structures, and I want to move the code as much as possible to develop. So as part of that, uh, when we architected it, we looked at Castle, which, had, as you said, is a bunch of mistakes and case statements, and it's fairly fixed in the way the execution path runs through. But with uh, Castle 2, if you just run Castle 2 with an angry config, it does nothing, it assumes nothing uh, of what you're trying to do. And that in order for you to build your model, you find everything about your model in the text files. And as Castle 2 interprets uh, each of the, the blocks within the, the model definition language, it constructs different objects of memory. So it has um, the, the, the design pattern we call it, it's a factory. So you pass into the factory. Uh, some identifiers, and it goes through the factory and says, oh, this is a process, and it's a constant recruitment or a permanent of recruitment, and it constructs that object of memory. And then with all of these objects constructed in memory, as you define the, the, the top level model, you define 
find your time steps and you assign processes to the time steps and time steps to the model. So by building out the model of all these objects, parcel two can parcel that and then only build the objects it requires and then put them together. Yeah, at some point I'll probably have to talk to Matthew on this, but the, the parallel effort that we have going on in the US is a model that we currently call the Meta Information Assessment System. And it is very Castle 2 like in that it's highly modular, uh, in that it creates at compile time the module that you design as a design document, as a design uh, input file that tells you. Which features to include, it builds those features, and then you have a very, uh, very slick, efficient operating model. Uh, we achieve proof of principle with this. We plug side by side with uh, simple statistical catching models, and uh, we just in the last month or two have gotten to that stage. So we have the beginnings of a model that is essentially Castle 2 like in its conception. Follows the principles that the Matthew laid out. He's a part coder. I think you can add on that, Matthew. Can I just say that it builds the model at compile time? Well, that was an error. We use a JSON front end. So we're building models. Of, um, it's a new JVM right there, just like you are, Castle. And then we construct a model. Uh, so, for instance, I got the it's got a series of some models like selected and so those are in stage two and uh, we built it basically an integer map of the whole model and then we built the actual family out there time. So essentially the same similar as the castle to the end. Yeah, first time we did. Yeah, I see those. Okay, any other questions or comments related to that topic or new question? Um, while we have a few of the main assessment, certain assessment packages that we offer here, I think it'd be really great to talk about open source. Making practice that you want to read, that open source is amazing in theory, but in practice, most of the Assessment packages are not open source or only accessible to very small developers. So I'd like to hear a bit more about what are the hurdles that are preventing us from having all of these software packages be open source. As someone who uses these packages, it's really hard to not have access to the code because then the package is a black box. And even though in theory there's really good documentation and practice, Documentation for new features also is often quite poor. And so, not having access to the actual code so that I can look at the equations, see what's going on in the wood, makes it really hard for me to want to come online and do something new from what's going on. So, it would be just great to hear from the developers why is it that not all packages are open source? Yeah, so it's a good so from the NOAA Fisheries and Urban Toolbox point of view, that's one of the things we're starting to try to do um, and why we have chosen GitHub um, as our server-based point for Git, because Git you can just use on your computer and you can see that again. Um, but at NOAA and some of these organizations, there are specific hurdles to getting your code to be open source. And in fact, even with the NOAA code, once it's on GitHub, it's not officially open source in the general open source licenses that occur. That's NOAA or other organizations have specific um, rules that you have to follow. And so just even put our code on GitHub, there's a huge process that's involved. And so it's just literally a slow process of moving everything towards that um, and making sure that the licensing work for making it open source to make it available. Also, in terms of older legacy code, um, we might not have the code available, we may only have it executable. So, working towards the future, starting when they went out on open source, I agree with you, but um, we have to follow our organization's rules. 
My experience is the opposite. I've seen the result of this. And uh, that there is, uh, I have to acknowledge that there is a huge push in, the, in Europe to have everything open source. And the European Commission has its own license for open source. So, in fact, you don't need to use licenses from other institutions to publish our code. Um, that is, but my, I think that the, my point is that there is a lot of institutional weight on being able to push your or to make your code open source. Um, we have we have the European license before that we were using the Creative Commons and before that the GDLs. The, in, in my opinion, one of the big source is to find that license that you want to use. That license allows you to actually publish the code and being able to not be not being not being fired back at you because someone goes and says, Oh, you're using this thing, this is wrong, and this is your fault. And this means that you need to be really careful about the license you use and you need to have institutional support. Otherwise, you can get into serious trouble by like publishing your code or not publishing your code, depends on what you're signing, if you don't have that kind of thing. Having said that, I, I understand that everything should be open source and published in all the code we do. We publish even uh, the reports, we publish the code, and actually we have been watched by people saying, why do you publish the code? It just makes things more confusing for us. So sometimes we have that part, so which is being open source doesn't mean that your code is actually readable. And the fact that you publish your code doesn't mean that people actually understand what you did or that they are able to find what you need to confuse and confuse about your Yeah, thanks, Alexa. Um, one thing to think about this, and maybe uh, later in the week on Friday, we'll be talking about some of the funding and things like that, is what structure do you do, use to uh, develop this model? Do you produce an independent organization that you can push funds to to get away from these institutional problems? Like if if no one or you won't release the code open source, then money's going to an independent organization in Canada. I, I need to jump in on the impression that NOAA does not support open source. NOAA is very much going open source. The, the National Weather Board, the huge building that supports weather forecasting, it is going open source. Um, so there's a version that is open source that is research community, and then after that, there's a version that is the operational model that runs on suitable hardware platforms, the operation of each 24 support. So the concept of open source is pretty strong. Um, well, I think open light, you know, SS has not been open source. The code has been released to anybody who's asked, and many people have asked. Um, making it open source long ago would have incurred the license expectations on this body for people who want to make modifications that I was not prepared to support responding to those questions. Um, and the alternative was to maintain an open dialogue with anyone who was interested in the features and to you know, build those features in. So, for better or for worse, you know, it's been essentially a closed source but open for viewing for a long time. And increasingly so, it's there. And I, I see us moving the next generation software to open source, but it does occur some expectations to maintenance in order to have a operational model that's producing. A legally bound management advice. Right? Have the management advice come from really the captain confident is as thoroughly tested as we expect it should be. I think that's the pearl of the source. If it's too easily modified and customized, we still achieve the same kind of testing standards that we also require to achieve. There's research aspects as well as standardized operational aspects. Yeah, 
think it's also important to note that uh, in the United States, we can't even license software. So if you really wanted to see it, you just want to So um no, not that check if I can pronounce this. Um yeah, so so being open source doesn't necessarily mean that anyone can change it. It just means that you have the code available so you can look through it to see where the problem is, which is what Laura was talking about. So there are different ways of dealing with this. Scott. I was going to say, uh, so the new ones castle sort of early days came up by open source. Uh, they originally tended to, but one of the reasons uh, we benefited from it as well is uh, when you incorporate open source libraries into your code, uh, it does imply some uh, legal requirements on you in terms of how you can license your own code, especially when you've got the DPL. So for us, Thanks. So I, I, I think uh, the comments that I would have on that um, in regards to multi channel CL, similar to Rick's, so, I mean, making something open source, I think, is more than just locking uh, the code in our website. Like it kind of implies a commitment um, to follow up with people who have questions about it, um, and and that obviously takes time and resources. If you don't have that, then um, you know it's, it's maybe a pointless exercise to, to do the open source. So as with stock synthesis, we would provide the source code to mysteriously interested people who want to look at it, but just putting it out there for you know, all of the PhD students in the world to, to get and, uh, you know, ask uh, uh, many questions about and, and expect assistance and so on is, is quite difficult. <laughs> um, so I think going forward with this effort, I think as we think about it, um, we need to think about having resources to make stuff open source, not just to put it out there and hope for the best. Thanks, John. I mean, I think there's a lot of open source projects that have dealt with this, like, you know, they just have user lists and that's all you need to help with other people. Um, okay. uh, so, uh, in Japan, we are uh, developing our package for the stock system. And uh, the package uses many other uh, library, and uh, the other uh, many library has a license for. A GPL. So we wonder uh, if we use a GPL R package, we have to be open uh, to our uh, package. Also, need to be GPL license. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm trying to ask a uh, scientist or a uh, statistician. So can anyone answer that question? I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> um, in general, if packaging code uh, with GPL, if the code is compiled into a binary for the orcs, yes, you do. Uh, if your software is unable to function without it, I'm more than likely, yes, it's typically guidance to follow. So in the case for R, we form uh, library on the outside. Is it in the it may be okay. 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 Thank you. Okay, the next one. So to see the GPL, uh, GPL is a form license and um, a lot of people will be into something called created homes, which is another type of license. In, in Europe, uh, the institution itself developed its own license, so there's a, something called the European government license, which is more open than the GPL. The GPL, I'm not a lawyer also, but as far as I understand, the GPL 
but random object, you have to keep a bunch of tweaks in the GPL that may make things really off. If you're really worried about that, you should get a lawyer and learn about it because it's really, uh, it's only a lot. Back to open source. Um, there's a lot of ways of dealing with open source and making sure that you don't get to reply to your PhD students or anything. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. No, 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 not of course. Uh, I'm just saying for those worried that you have to reply to PhD students. I'm not worried about that. Uh, but, but I think open source in this sense, for me at least in my perspective, open source is about transparency. That's when it comes in this particular process. It's not about it's not about uh, people extending it or not extending it or reading it or not reading it. Honestly, the, the FLR code is open source, and, and I doubt that even those developing FLR come to the environment. So it's 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 just a matter that it's there. So if you, if you want to look into it, you can look into it, and and that means that it's it's. In, in my opinion, it's more related to the transparency of the process than to about making things better. But because at the end of the day, if your coding is difficult in terms of not being organized, not being common, not being documented, it's as good as being closed source. Nobody's going to read that or understand it in any way. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a request to ask you to put their hands up. Yeah, I think open source is a good idea. That was hard to count. So, who thinks open source is a bad idea? It's a consensus. It, it's um, Yes. We're kind of going off the topic a little bit. So, Jim, you got a question that's on the topic? Well, uh, um, maybe it's on topic, maybe it isn't. I was going to ask, uh, looking through the agenda, I didn't see, um, and maybe I missed it, much discussion about uh, software development that leverages activities in other fields. And mostly, I think, products like STAM that, that's pretty well developed, and one of the features. I think it's probably most important that GMB is that to plug into it. Um, whereas other packages and software development can't do that so easily. And I just wonder, is there going to be, is now going to be time to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So, so you say that we should have an environment that's more like TMB rather than ADMB so you can use all the functionality and assets? So I've been observing. Castle for, for when it first started, and they went and wrote their own driven package uh, and chose not to use ADMB when it was available back then. And so, admirable effort. I think if they had to do it over again, they might, might have done it differently. You know, um, Scott was talking about three different auto packages. And, and I think. I really like about the TMB approach is that it's taking advantage of packages and other software libraries that are out there already well developed and tested. I just wonder, as a fisheries community, I we mean, uh, stuff that a lot of the work that Matthew's done is that very low level calculation type problems. And you know, I guess how much of our resources should we be spending? Doing that kind of thing versus, you know, taking advantage of other other things that are out there and going forward, in, investing some time to those. I guess I don't know who's who's look, looking at those visions. So any comments on that? But I guess a question would be for like the castle developers: um, Would it be possible to? Take what you've implemented in Castle to make it not necessarily an R, but somehow related so it can use other packages other than anything that's in C. So, so that's a tricky 
uh, it's going to the stack developers. Uh, and the answer is yes, we're going to the stack. But there is a for us uh, in the way that uh, it's considered devices as well. To provide you, uh, as far as other packages, we would desire to run up to the track, so we support ALC out the box, CPD out of the uh, box, out the box, I support the likes of ADP, TMP. Um, they're really difficult for us uh, and it's for uh, a bunch of them for the JSP. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so, so for us, it's been a big focus on um, not reinventing the wheel in Castle 2. Uh, so we didn't write the Norway Drift package, uh, one of us, well, no. um, I don't want to go down that path, I'm not a bit of a match right? um, But there are enough of them out there already that we could pick up and use. So, so the, the base Castle 2 package uh, comes with three of them, uh, and it comes with a non auto differentiation. Um, Component and then it comes with the unit test built in. So, anyone who gets Castle 2 can actually just run the unit tests on the machine uh, or could build models using the model definition language with one of the three different uh, auditive systems. One of them being the original one from Castle from the 80s. Um, and yes, you can be ABA again and your version of ALC. Uh, I'm going to be looking at putting another two uh, auditive systems in and looking more into the idea of incorporating STAN, uh, especially for MTO. So, what about the in the packages that TMP uses for doing a whole lot of stuff like oh, no, TMP or Fast or some other um, software you use? Um, I'm not sure if you know what Inmar is. I don't. No interfaces. So, one of the problems, I think. Uh, and it's probably not a problem that's solvable that I've seen in Castle 2 because um, I liked the idea of having all these minimizers because you know, it gives you a few switches and check sensitivity to your you know, local you know, and that will convince yourself you're actually a little bit of it. But uh, the thing about it is the sparsity to uh, Castle 2. Even I like get third party libraries, but one of the problems I think you know, fully thought through is um, with general with the generality of like having all these new third party minimizers and access to it, um, it also can make it difficult to bring in a, a linear algebra library for dealing with sparsity because they have this kind of generic touch floating around which aren't consistent with some of these third party libraries. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's just a lot of playing early on with what functionality uh, would want. Because I mean, some things that I'm interested in, Castle 2 is kind of you know, going looking at the CDP and everything. I mean, more going towards TMB. Um, but I feel there needs to be a lot more work around the linear algebra libraries. So that's, that's a lot. Of, I think that's where a lot of the speed comes from, TMB as a Anyone else got comments on that? Any other question? Yeah. Yeah, the, the general question from the application side, specifically with this last bullet view, um, and perhaps those in the US that are dealing with kind of model development, is the intent for new features to be incorporated into like the main model? That soon we'll just have one model with all of these different bells and whistles. Um, would be the first question. The second question is related to that. that you know, at, at what point do you balance that? Something like this, yeah, that can do everything under the sun, or just allowing um, individual groups to go off on their own and develop specific applications um, for their work. I'm sure everyone's got a different answer, but uh, from my point of view, you know, these two very different worlds that are represented in this world, right? the production world, where we've got to do assessment that go into um, decision processes, but there's also research. So, um, you know, if I'm developing a new mathematical model, 
I probably will do it myself in my own way. I don't want to have to work out how to fit it into this huge morass called stock synthesis. If Rick says what I did was worth doing, uh, I tend to think of Rick as the ball from Star, uh, uh, Star Trek. Uh, if he finds anything he likes, he assimilates it. Uh, and uh, I've been assimilated a few times over the years. And I think that, that, that you know, from my point of view, I, I like stock synthesis because it has been well tasted, it's well documented. If there was a really bad bug, it's probably been found by somebody else. So for production assessments, it's fantastic. But for development assessments, I think we can be far more efficient uh, in, in what we do. So I don't think that we need to uh, draw a, a hard, fast line. I think there'll always be science behind stock assessment as well as the number crunching we have to do to keep the revenues that pays where the next that gets paid. That's not me, but I can have On the question of basically how many features have in the next generation model, it, one aspect of my answer is of, of course you want to have access to features. It's more how we build them in. Do we build them in efficiently, like they're built in SS right now, or do we build them in in a more modular way so that uh, code maintenance and operation is more efficient, faster, uh, and Many ways better. So it, it's not a either or. It's, it's basically how we build in a rich feature set. But the, the downside of feature set, and I think I would make the same comment with regard to the multiplicity of uh, AD packages that are available. Uh, you know, the diversity uh, begets uh, confusion on the user part. Uh, it, it's anti good practices. And I, I think that one of the, the aspects of SS is that I've gone too far in presenting to the user all the available options that are out there. Whenever Mark says, oh, I want a new growth function, well, I can find a way to put it in. Now we have one more growth function that's available. And the same with selectivities, uh, you know, and uh, so as the features grow, uh, we need to be attentive to having enough testing going with it so that we are presenting the less experienced user with better sense of what is a good practice and where are you on your own to be experimenting with the available options. If I could add something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, first, in response to Andre, I, I would note that Andre is on the Statistical Committee associated with our Council process, so he's actually the gatekeeper of which new features are deemed worthy or not. And when he says it's worthy, it has to go into stock synthesis because that will be used for him. But my fear, I mean, the, the real computer scientists, who's you know Matthew, Scott, Kareem, who spoke this morning, I present a very compelling uh, story of why we want professional programmers doing our programming. But I fear that. In, with this sort of production assessment versus academic research development assessment division, I fear that the pace of the research and moves so fast that if the production assessment is being done the right way with design documents and you know, a team of people developing it and, and sort of all the things that we want to do well, that by the time version one is done, it will be obsolete because we'll the, the academics will tell us that we need version three of it. So how do, how do we get around? I mean, in an ideal world, you know, Castle 2 is extensible, modular, et cetera, and those, those research things can be plugged in in an easy, straightforward way. But, but there's other things like multi-species considerations, MSC considerations that, that you know, might require a fundamental change in this of your estimation. So, so we have uh, maybe one developer for 250 stuff. So we're not there for us. Fair enough. Okay. Good. But the answer is higher more. Okay, Scott. Just to, to, to talk more on the research versus the productionization. Uh, with a good productionization system, uh, we don't do it yet in Castle 2. So it's an option to bind into other languages. If you are running a model in Puzzle 2 and you want a function that doesn't exist, then the option should be there for you to specify an external R file or Python file that 
has that code for you and then pass it through just pushes out a matrix of the population or something of that nature to your file and you do your processing and just return it. So you don't have to play with pass through the code base, you don't have to look at anything, you just say, actually this part of my uh, model goes out to an R file that will go all the way for pass it through and then just hands it back. That kind of uh, language binding from C++, uh, especially it's quite easy to do, uh, it is on our to do list for a future. Yeah, that's true. I mean, going from version zero to version one is going to take a long time, right? But going from version one to version two shouldn't take that long if you built it right. But there's still a risk of being behind the research, like you said. But I think the whole reason this workshop is happening is because there's a huge vulnerability in the field that single people maintaining the code and and this you know there was a big boom in the 90s and basically we're still using those same platforms that were developed in the 90s um this way people is going to retire obviously right so that's got to be why we're here so everything doesn't just fall apart <laughs> 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 so um, we got Jim, we've got like eight or nine minutes left, so what do you want to do before we get on to more questions is how about we have another vote? Who who votes that we should have professional programmers doing some of the all of the three? Now this is this is production, not for research or <laughs> so computer programmers who know what they're doing as opposed to stock assessment scientists. So that's the some, some, or a majority of them. So voting now. Nobody. <laughs> Okay. Should the majority of the programming, more than 50%, be done by professional programmers? <laughs> so, there's two parts to this, so I think you should make the distinction structure. So, for example, building in, in the case of parcel 2 the NDL structure around which you plug in the, the population dynamics now. And I think if I understand Scott correctly, he doesn't create selectivity patterns. He creates a platform within which you can build selectivity patterns. And I think the building of the platform and the filling in of the, the, the slots, if you want to call them, in, in the case of synthesis, those case statements, uh, I don't think you're a Rick or an ADMP. I'm not sure about that. Um, so I, I think if you could be clear what, what, what is some, because I'm not sure that Scott wants to take responsibility for plotting. For coding uh, selectivity patterns. I would probably say some is anything that's enterprise level. I would actually, particularly for version one, the first version, which would not require that much development and stuff, you we know, should have. Um, I'm talking about coding selectivity. I think the question is not quite complete because you're saying who should do the programming? Well, I would agree professional programmers are only once they've received a detailed specification, which is how I interpreted uh, what was said about two, whereby the specification is made by somebody that's interested in that stuff, and then somebody who really knows what they're doing programming, the program. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. I think Andre is saying no, that shouldn't be the case. This should be the underlying foundational code be created by the programmer, and then the specific features like a selectivity curve or a frequent curve or a natural mortality relationship should be programmed by somebody else. I agree with that. Can't you just take the basic form model all of those? So many of them 
You may not need a professional programmer to augment a detailed alternative within the structure that the professional has built. But you don't need to bring the professional back in to change five lines of code to implement the new selectivity pattern if they built it the way we need it to begin with. So it's, it's a can, it's not an or. Continuing to present it as an or, it's just not obvious. <laughs> So I'm talking about the initial model, not any improvements over time or additions and features. I mean, I, I would be, I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried even letting people do that because you have to basically have some decent training and everything and some standards and all that to make sure that it's done correctly because what happens is you get, um, Code that goes in there that's inefficient, or maybe even breaking other code and stuff. If if there is ways to break it, but but mark a specification and include code. I I, I want a security code. Here's your question. Here's my first trial at a code. Similarly goes with the rest of the code base. If you've got it, it might be that would be up to the programmer as to whether or not it'd be easier for them to translate that into efficient code or just start from the equation. But it, I, I do believe that code itself can constitute part of the specification. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's too early for that quote. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons is that I see we have different ideas what a code or a program needs. Because I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, and that for this part of the code, the diagnosis, for example, I don't want the computer science designing the diagnosis. Definitely, I don't want the computer science designing the visualization part of it. The presentations we have today are very helpful. We don't want the computer science designing the visual part. And so, what, what we are calling the program at this point, I think it's different from what we're So, I would say it's a bit too early for that. Um, what, what, what I think is that the, the people with the right background should be the one they know what to do. So if we are talking about efficient coding, that should be a computer scientist. If we are talking about designing the model features, then maybe a scientist programmer would be the right person. If we are talking about diagnostics or something like that, maybe a statistician would be the right person. If we are talking about visualization, maybe we need design. You know, the right people should be doing what they know what to do and not ourselves say now. I'm a great designer, so I'm going to do it. I guess that could be my Yeah, thanks. I agree with Ernesto. I'm thinking back to Matthew's uh, talk this morning where he was talking about stakeholders. And I was asking about design documents. So I think I see it as there are programmers and programmers communicate with others. And there's these groups of people who just communicate with so I think it's hard to answer your question, but I see it as programmers do what they do best, and stock system scientists do what they do best, and statisticians do what they do best, and it should work out. So that would mean the assigned the stock system people would like the specifications and the programs and the programming. Um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that would be the best thing, but um, in a business environment, you don't have the, the stock in it and it's writing code for the, the, the technical analysis of the stocks, right? They will give a specification to a program and the program will run. So, how does that differ from us? We're not business people. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I can give an example of similar work being done in the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, where you have expertise in statistics, and a lot of times they're not making specification. They're making a specification document that might include code. In fact, it might include code that they've written in R, and they create models in R that completely work. And then they do pass off those working models 
to uh, software designers and programmers that then convert it to C++. So there is uh, continual communication, but code and working models and research is heavily a part of that business structure. And it's not just a one-off um, at the beginning and both people are coding. <laughs> Any other comments? Um, just maybe something, another way to think about it is to think, is it more important to have badly written code that may or may not be efficient, but that all the users can read and understand? And I'm not talking here about someone who's kind of talking about like a good service as a scientist who can program well. Um, or is it more important to have a code, a separate package that's optimized to max, super fast, super everything, but it's a black box for everything outside of software engineering. Well, I think it can be both. I think that the fact that the code is well, well written doesn't mean that the code is not in fact, you know, what Matthew was responsible this morning was that it's more reasonable. That when spaghetti goes, that uh, Stark Assessment Scientist went right, may not be very reasonable at all. It just flows in, in some way that gets the job done, but it's really hard to digest what that flow actually is. Whereas it probably could be much more reasonable if it's written by professional programmers. So I, it's, it's more than in the readability aspect of it. It should be uh, the design document. It should be the main thing. You know, the design document should be the thing that's really well written and can be understood by the main gives a lot. I think that's where you need an emphasis so that and then the testing you just need to have enough effort to demonstrate that the code does what the and that we learn to trust that we don't need to know the details of the code in order to use it because there's so many things we put in life that are like that all the time. I think we need to achieve that with the production software that we're using. So, there's no other questions, we'll break for.